Hey everybody, welcome back to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Christian. This week, we have a good friend of mine, someone I've fished with on a number of times, put me on some absolutely excellent brown trout, as a matter of fact. Um, this is Steve Daly from the uh, uh, Daly Ozark Fly Fisher. This is in Carter, Arkansas. And Steve, you specialize in the uh, White, wa or White River water system, which is an awesome system. I've fished it with you on the White River in the Norfolk. Uh, some of the other areas I've fished independently, but, um, you know, what an amazing system. The thing that I want to talk about today that's different is I always come out in the fall when it's colder and the, the bite is on for big streamers and it's streamer fest and we focus streamer, streamer, streamer. And you've built this uh, wonderful name of streamers for yourself and fishing with Kelly and all those other guys, et cetera. But a lot of people don't know and understand that, the water system actually drops in a lot of times and it can be more accessible and there are prolific hatches. I mean, I've seen hatches of caddises, for example, where it is just swarms and fish are going everywhere. So I'm really excited to talk about the different phases of the summer system. And then we're going to wrap up the show at the end of the day with a, a tip in discussion around body position and casting. There are some key elements that you identified to me that really can set you up for success if you just position your body correctly. We're going to tell people how to do that. So thanks for coming to the show. It's good to have you again, see your face and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get at it here today. Yeah. It's been a while, mate. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think how many years it's been since you've been down here. I think it was even That's... pre COVID. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, nice to see you sitting here. I think we're both a little grayer these days. Um, yeah, yeah, just a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or the river's still there. It's still doing its thing as it wants to, you know, this water flow up and down. Um, but it is a, it's a special place down here. And it's a different fishery. And, you know, I, I you might tell by my accent, or, you know, you know I've, I've, I've been around a little bit and didn't yep. actually start off in Arkansas. Um, right. You came here. You came here from Tasmania in two thousand one, yep. right? Yep. Okay, perfect. And it wasn't yep. correct. I actually, I actually had several years in, uh, oh, living in uh, 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 Huntington Beach, California, Surf City. Ah. Yeah, not <laughs> bad. Not a bad change. And, and traveling and fishing. Um, I did actually, I did actually do some surf fishing there, not brilliantly well, but I did do some surf fly fishing there. Uh, caught a halibut at Long Beach Harbor. Okay, nice. Um, so it's been a long thing, but this is the first river that, or first waterway that I ever really got to know over a long period, and it has been a long time now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm a lot older than I was. I used to think I was one of the young guys around, but now I'm, I'm, I'm creeping into decrepitude, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, but it's getting to know a river system intimately like being able mm -hmm. to see cycles in seasons and it's a different ball game you know yeah. it, 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 you, you, once you build up that level of historic knowledge and I, i've seen it happen with other you know old guys um, right but it's 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 a different ball game when you get to know a river like that and you get to spend so much time on that waterway you know um yeah, it's different too because, like you said, it's a system. I mean, you fish the White the White River differently than you fish the Norfolk, yep. which I mean, they're they're hand tied to each other. And I've been on boat with you or with other guides in your team that have said, "Oh no, up here we don't do that. Up here we do this." Yeah, and it just fishes and, a little different. Yep, no, and you know, Norfolk steeper, faster. Um, what they call the Norfolk tailwater. And I should explain that because it confused buggery out of me for a number of years. So Norfolk Tailwater comes out of Norfolk Dam, but the original river is the North Fork of the White, which is a beautiful little stream. And, you know, when I first came here, the guys that brought me from northwest Arkansas, because my ex-wife got employed by uh, uh, Walmart. That's why I moved to mm. Arkansas. Okay. And then we started driving. And in those days, it was like almost four hours to get over here. And we'd come and fish the Norfolk because it was more like a Western River. It's steeper, shorter pools, 
um, nice little drops, good fast water. It's, a, it's just a spectacular river. And in those days, it was a giant brown trout river. Now it's just got really big brown trout, right? Yeah. <laughs> and kind of the whites taken over as the giant brown trout. Right. And, uh, you know, there's still there's still 26, 27, 28 inch brown trout in there. Yeah. And it's phenomenal. Yeah. And big cutthroat and um, giant rainbows. We lucked into one of those uh, 18 months ago. Um, yeah, I think. I think it was two trips ago for me. I got a beautiful cutthroat on that river. Man, yeah, it's a really yeah. nice and it, fish. It, that's a it's it's a spectacular little river as well. And mm -hmm. you know the that river is is different to the white. And the white to a lot of people walking up to it the first time just looks so damn big. <laughs> yeah, it's big. It's wide. It, you know, it looks big. Plain across, right? There's not a lot of structure going nope. across in the winter time at least. Um, but there's tons of structure along the banks. Yep. And so I remember my first impression was, man, this is a big, heavy river. Like, wow. Oh, but look at all this structure on the, on the edge. We're going to be slamming those banks, slamming those banks, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, w and what's your perspective on it now that you've been there for years? Is it, is it like well, that or all, is it? It's all water flow, man. Like there yeah. is, and it, it changes because if people don't know, right, so the White River below Bull Shoals Dam is the section we're talking about. And there are eight generators on that power station, each which can throw out 3,200 CFS. The difference between 650 CFS at the low end and 24,000, 25,000 at the high end is about eight feet in water. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. So you've got a very different river. I mean, where the edges are, where the drop-offs, where the structure, where the humps are. Um, you have islands which are disappear. They go away. Right, now, right. You're fishing, now you're fishing them. Now you're fishing them as a hump in the river and fishing according to the height. Right. You know, uh, that's where you're looking for fish. You might be going. You might be in twenty-four thousand CFS and throwing a dry fly on top of that hump where there's three foot of water. But mm -hmm. if you, once you get off the edges, you're now in 12 feet of water. You know, it's, it's, that's the nature of this beast, which makes it, what makes it so, A, so interesting, right? You can, cause there, there's so much variation, but B, it also makes it tough coming here. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, I don't want to say, I'm not, right, leave me out of this, but, you know, the guides here have to be really adaptable. And it yeah, makes them they do. really good. Because it's not like, you know, that it's one of the things here that you can have such rapid changes in water. And if you haven't got plan B, <laughs> you don't yeah, know what to do when that water changes six feet in two that's hours. Right. And that's it right there. I was going to make that point that, those fluctuations can change in a day. I mean, you hear the bells go off and the water's changing. Mm -hmm. It's not like a lot of areas. I mean, they need power, they need power and they run it. Uh, some areas it's, we only do it on odd days or whatever it is. There's uh, a different management mm -hmm. application. And in this case, it's on a daily basis. I've been there where we've gone up, blow the dam, we fished and you're like, oh no, they're letting water loose. We're going to, we're going to jump way down river. We're going to get up on the Norfolk and fish that for the rest of the day. Yeah. Or the vice versa, you know, and it, yeah. it, it's up or down. I like that. <laughs> like everywhere else, we've had guides come in here and <clears throat> come to fish our water, particularly when we started making the name as a, as a streamer becker. You know, it was always a double-edged sword. Not only mm -hmm. did we make ourselves more, make our own lives more valuable. You know, we had more people coming to, to help our businesses and uh, all of us here. And then, <laughs> but we also got people coming in and I've seen some of those guys that not read the water right and just get stuck, mm -hmm. right? The water drops and suddenly they can't get around the river at all. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's, that's a big one on the Norfolk. Like that can catch out even experienced guides at times. So yeah, yeah. it is a tough place to come 
if you're not familiar with reading these water flows and reading what's going on and knowing where to be, uh, it can be a it can be a challenging place. But it's right. also what makes it interesting, you know. Yeah. And let's the, talk about the, the, the summer. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about the summer. Um, do you do? You know, I've been there in the fall. Um, yep. Waters are usually a little Golden, higher. It Golden seems Golden like. Winter. Yeah, yeah, and they're flowing them in the summer. Though I've heard descriptions of, oh no. There's areas of the river where you can almost walk across, or there's a lot more structure at times when the water's low, et cetera. Can you talk about how you see that through the summer and then how that affects the various hatches? I know there's a, a big sulfur in caddis hatch, and then there's a terrestrial so, season. So water flows, water flows really, uh, power to peak power demand comes in winter, obviously. When it's cold, people are running their heaters, and then summer when they're running air conditioning. Now things have slightly changed since COVID, and I think it's a lack of you know the people working from home now. Right? There's not the mm. big demands to heat and cool all those offices. And while our power doesn't necessarily stay, all of it gets stay and sold sold locally. Um, it goes into the grid. We, you know, we see things have changed a little bit, right? Okay. Then you can't read it the same way. Now, that being said, the traditional times for lower flows is true fall. What you're calling fall, I'm calling winter. Right, <laughs> right. Technology, all right? <clears throat> so, so for us, it's those mild temperatures, generally lower flows. And that was where our caddis hatch came in in spring. And, you know, which is coming up, and April and May are spectacular. Like, it, it was the first hatch. Like, honestly, when I came to Arkansas, when I moved to Arkansas the, and, and started living over here in 2007 and guiding, the caddis hatch wasn't like it is now. It didn't flow up all the, all the, over the river. And no one's put a def, definitive reason on why. But now the, the best section is the, the top, 10 miles below the dam, whereas it used to be mm. the other way. It would run up and it wouldn't hit above much above, um, say, 12 miles from the dam itself. Now it's all the way. Mm. And it has, it is again subject to these flows. Like this last season wasn't probably the best season we've had. We had a window of spectacular years of very low water, uh, at, least in the, at least in the morning. And it was, it was silly good. Last yeah. year was I mean, good. <laughs> Last year was I've, I've seen it. <laughs> right? I've seen photos where I, I just couldn't believe my eyes. Yeah. How well, thick. Every year, every year apart from last year, there was at least one high 20s inch fish caught. Some years, two or three. And I'm talking 28, 29 inch fish. Yeah. And people get On a dry fly. <laughs> no, no, not on a dry fly. Sorry. Oh, this okay. Nipping, right? This just is nipping. nipping. Okay. This is, and this is that's the reason why the nymphing was so popular here, because you actually had a shot at something insane. Mm. Um, and by nymphing, I'm talking people running oh, a two-fly rig, 16 and an 18, right? And you're catching a 30-inch fish virtually on a on an 18. It, it craziness, craziness. The 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 dry fly fishing. Is really good, and I wish it was. I wish it was spread out a little more over the river. The one downside is that it's a little can be a little crowded at times. But if you know your place, you can pick your way through. Uh, okay. You know, it's like a lot of the. I just had some guys in from Pennsylvania, and they're like, "Yeah, we we go and post up on a spot and sit on it all day." And because I'm Australian, Tasmanian, that's not what we did. We we moved and right. roamed and spot to spot and shared water around like that. Doesn't work that yeah. way anymore. You got to find your spot and pick off your fish, and and it can be really good. <laughs> yeah, you know. Can you fish? Can, can you fish, fish from the bank in the in the summer, or is it more of like depends okay. on water flow? And a lot of these fish, a lot of the rising fish, really aren't necessarily sitting on your inside bends where you get good access. They're on the outside bends, the big steep banks under the bluffs, a lot of times. And that makes it hard to access. But that mm -hmm. access is here, is always been, um, 
you get access around the walk-ins, but there's a lot of river between the walk-ins. That's why boat fishing is so good here. Not yeah. only is the water high, but you get away from people and you get access to all that river. And yeah, there's 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 nothing like it at times. I mean, we all love posting up on fish, but you know, oh, yeah. a fifteen inch, they're not super. They're not super shy on 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 a size on, on the choice of fly during cat okay. season. Um, a size sixteen. Uh, caddis, yeah, caddis. You know, um, I have my preferences. You know, I, I really love a little parachute caddis because it's easy for customers to see amongst all the bugs. Um, but a Ralph Cutter ZC caddis, the uh, pattern I love too. That's a really nice low rider that they'll eat pretty much every time. Um, yeah, fishing those, you know, it, it's it's silly, but you. You might not, <laughs> you might not ping that thirty incher, but you're going to have a lot of really nice shots, eighteen, twenty two, twenty three, and then there's the bigger ones too. And mm. if you can find one, and make the right choices, and then not let him break you off. I had, I had one that was that I really wanted the last two years. We last summer we broke him off twice. So, you know, that's that. <clears throat> that's fishing. <laughs> that's fishing. <laughs> you want, if you make oh. a great drift and and get the fish to eat, yeah. I mean, when they stick their nose out and eat, that's that's that's. <clears throat> can I say sex on a stick? I don't know. It's just <laughs> that is the most fun, right? Yeah, it, it is. If you come up, it's like that's the moment. That's that's what makes me come back. You know, that's what gives you the flutter. Yeah, for yeah, me too. It does. Uh, yeah, it does. And just those little you're... beaks. When you're targeting them, are you typically fishing a dry dropper rig or do you also fish a bobber rig uh, yeah, in a lot of I scenarios mean, too? It uh, depends on your customer. And you, I might mm -hmm. fish I might fish bobber part of the day and then go and try for some shots on to get some fish in the boat, get some brown trout in the boat. And like you talk to White River guides on the caddis, they're talking brown trout. They're not talking rainbows, right? Yeah. Um, so they'll tell you, oh yeah, we put eight, you know, eight, ten, twelve browns to pull fish in the boat today, and that's they're just talking the browns. They don't even count the others. It's, they don't count the. Uh, I know there's like shake offs. I always laughed about that at uh, yeah, at the yeah. white. You catch a nice mm -hmm. rainbow, and everybody's shaking it off. Oh, it's a that's a rainbow. You know, you're like, yeah. wait a minute. Like if I was out another river, that would be like a prized catch. Yep, yep. And, and it used to be the same. We started to streamer fish, and we'd shake off twenty ones, twenty twos. You know, it's silliness. Yeah. But the um, – so I'll, I'll switch tactics according to what the fish are doing. And if I get a shot, like the, if you can find some early feeders on top, yeah, go up before the, before the rest of the packs had to come in, had a chance to come in and get them. But equally, there'll be times during the day there really you want to focus on running uh, a nymph setup. And sometimes I run a dry dropper, but again, you know, we're creatures of habit. I still love – Fly fishing to me is one dry fly. Let's go find a head coming up and let's catch it. Mm -hmm. That's what I love doing. <clears throat> so anyway, we started talking about this. So I want to move on from caddis. If anyone wants to fish caddis and come on, there is still business around, but it's it's busy, right? Yeah. It, it does yeah. because it is so good and it's built such a reputation. Um, it draws people from all around our state. So you're probably looking. You want to start booking now. Right, and yeah. you might get what you want. Um, better bet, yeah. Book this year, and then book twenty five at the same time. It's the, uh, I mean, I've I've been booking twenty twenty five for a long time. Um, yeah, and I know some of our, you know, some of my other colleagues are the same. Um, but once you roll off that, like the end of May, and we roll into. Sorry, I had a squirrel to distract my attention. <laughs> um, the once we Is come up, sulfurs? In, uh, yeah, you start to roll into sulfurs, and depending on the year, they may even cross over. So you have sulfurs and caddis on the water. Um, this year, not so much. In your previous year, yeah, and the previous year we had sulfurs mm, probably for two months. Um, but the water flows this year. Uh, irony of ironies, the sulfurs seem to do better in the higher flows. Hmm. Uh -huh. 
Not sure okay. why, but in that lower flow this year, the hatch was shorter. It was really good some days. I mean, I had two gentlemen over who weren't dry fly fishing experts by any means, enjoyed it. And, you know, we got, I think we got 10 up to 23. Um, hmm. And that was that was on dries. And that's yeah. a fun afternoon. Right? In the morning, we piddled what... around and didn't do too much. But in the afternoon, oh, yeah, we lit them up. Yeah. Um, what's, what's the size you're fishing on a sulfur down there? 16s or 18s. 16s and 18s, so yep. still a pretty visible fly. Yeah, I well, mean, comparatively, I'm, I'm getting yeah. old, and small. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I've been doing is adapting, downsizing a few of the patterns that I used to fish for mayflies back home in Tasmania. They've been getting eaten, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, great Laurie Matcham pattern that I, I've taken all over this country, and it's a little floating emerger. Um, okay. It, it, Okay, in Tasmania, emer we call emerges floating nymphs. Yeah. Not a soft tackle, right? Different. Yeah, yeah. Different thing. <laughs> well, as I came to the south, they all wanted to call emerger as a soft tackle. And it's like, no, no, it's a wet fly. It's a swing. Yeah, it's a wet fly. <laughs> right. Um, now, do you do you fish stuff? some of your your um, emergers in the skim as well? Or, you know, gink them up and fish them real light in the skim? Or do you fish them typically almost all the way underneath? Mm. No, no, no. They're they're my emerges pretty much are uh, floating nymphs. Right? Okay. So they're, they're, they're a lot of the body's wet and hanging down and just a little low riding parachute hackle and a little foam post and they're just sitting right in there. And sometimes they'll there. sink under. Yeah. Sometimes they'll sink under and you'll get them there. But mm -hmm. I run them behind something like uh film critic. Okay. You know a film critic? Um mm -hmm. That's the you know, Quigley's dry fly patterns. <laughs> I've always loved, you know, if, if, I, I never got to go and fish his waters when I was living in California, which is kind of a disappointment. But right. you know, there's there's too many places to fish, mate. You can't fish them That's all. Right. I, I finally <laughs> came to that decision. It's like I didn't start fly fishing until I was in my mid twenties and I was angry yeah, stuff to get them all in. I was angry at him for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think the then guy you mix in your salt water and you're like, oh gosh, mm -hmm. whole nother world. Uh, yeah, and, and like, it's like, yeah, what do you think some idiot moved 13,000 miles from home, you know? Yeah. yeah exactly. a stupid little spotty fish. That's um, right. But the, the, to come back to those sulfurs, the sulfurs is really good. And then you roll out of sulfurs into our terrestrials. And I don't know. If, I, I love, I always had a love hate with caddis. A caddis used to kick my butt when I was a, when I was a starting with fly fishing. These days, yeah, okay. I really enjoy this hatch, but it was the one that was like, eh, I should be catching more fish, and I'm not. Sulfurs, mayflies, love them. First love, absolutely. Give me a sulfur or a little larger, you know, March Brown, which is kind of akin to our Highland Dumb back in Tassie. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a happy boy. Uh, but... First decent trout I ever caught was on a Dave Whitlock, um, Dave's Hopper, right? Okay. Full body, old school. Yep. As the first caught trout I caught that was, I caught properly, which in a Tasmanian sense is you see the fish, you cast to it, you feed it, and then you catch it. Because back home at the time, the, the you you were kind of looked at a little funny if you threw a nymph and if if you the the whole reason to exist was that you went and you found your target with your eyes whether That's you right. see it in the water or see it rising and you didn't cast until you spotted your target right that's why i say i'm a one fly kind of guy yeah um, it, well, there was wasn't the that blind fishing thing. mentality no that and, blind and fishing it, mentality didn't exist <laughs> um <laughs> The only thing we did it for was sea run brown trout, but I barely, I really, I, I've learned all my nymphing in the US. I didn't know how to nymph when I came over here. Give me a dry fly, <laughs> give me a creamer of some sort. Um, but that was the kind of the, that was the game we played. Um, so anyway, come back to terrestrials. Um, I'll call them terrestrials, not hoppers, because we actually have, we don't have that many pure grass banks. Like it's not not grassy farmland pasture and what we mm -hmm. have is a mix of um uh woody hillsides 
right? Trees, over, a lot of overhanging trees, tall trees, understory. Oh, down trees, yeah. Yeah, and, and stuff that's – so you're getting bugs falling on the water. So you're getting our annual cicadas, you're getting – hoppers you're getting leaf hoppers you're getting katydids and you're getting and depending on the year you'll get grasshoppers as well i mean you know, we had mm-hmm. a first year i moved over here we had a spectacular uh, hatch of flying grasshoppers that had hit the water at 10 o'clock in the morning and it was you could wade it and the water was low and it was unbelievable it was a first, i took my wife fly fishing at rim shoals and and I, I left her, it was the first time I really let her do her own thing. And I just remember hearing her giggling away, catching brown tree. <laughs> and it was just like, okay, uh, I, I think I should stay married to this woman. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're also, funny part of that story is, and I'll get myself in trouble here, but we were actually supposed to pick up uh, her two daughters from school first day at school in a new town and we were late not because Uh-oh. of me because of my wife and she never <laughs> griped at me for being late from fishing the other time. <laughs> that's um, awesome but yeah the the terrestrials here and it it's it's actually better on higher flights too like i said the salt mm-hmm. because they'll you actually can get high consistent water so at least 6,000 CFS is one of where I like it, and you start to get some nice seams along the banks, and those fish will go and sit there. And if they don't, yeah. if that water isn't dropping out, they don't have to leave. And you okay. kind of want it to change enough, because otherwise you'll know where they all are. And it, it moves them around a little bit. But, yeah, it can be silly good fun. You know, there's <laughs> – there's, I've seen – I think out of the shop we've got three fish around thirty inches in the last ten years on a hop. Right, and that's just one shot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty cool. And I mean, you know, yeah. two of those were a long time ago, and one was two years ago. And you know, it's a thirty-inch trout. That's they're big. They're big on a screen. Yeah. You know, yeah, and coming up and getting up on the surface and eating a piece of foam. Holy mother of God! It's like that. Yeah, mm, that's that's serious. Um, and that's just it's time and effort and and being in the right place on those water flows and, and making a good cast, making a good yeah. cast and being able to seize the moment, seize the moment when they eat and act right. I mean, I, we could have had another one, but I screwed it up. I was running a boat and fishing with a buddy, and we both saw it and we ate, and it was way out of season too. It wasn't supposed to eat that day. And I'm trying to run a boat in 14,000. I've got lion around my feet. I've got lion everywhere. And I, I screwed it up because I, I forgot I was running a 10-pound test on. I was a bit a little gentle on it. So, yeah. yeah, one of those fish you remember. Well, let's but, talk about setting up for those mistakes. Yep. Can let's I come talk back about one your... thing? Can yeah, I come yeah. One thing? So sure. I mentioned this. So next year in spring. Oh, the... Sorry. I should say, given when we're, when we're doing this, um, in May and June this year, we are scheduled to have our next 13-year cicada hatch. I was here for the last one, and everyone was a little nervous about it. We're actually we're setting up the shop at that time, and it was good, but it wasn't great. Like, it was really spotty where the fish were, because we'd had big floods beforehand, um, really high water. In fact, they opened the shop and, and put out 50,000 CFS with floodgates, so it flooded a lot of banks. So okay. we, possibly we lost a lot of cicadas. But we managed one 30-inch brown trout on that to cel- celebrate the opening of the shop. The owner of the shop got it. I took him fishing, and we no, saw wow. a fish rise. We saw a fish rise. And he said, should I throw it? And I said, well, you've seen it rise, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> what are you waiting for? <laughs> throw it, throw it, I'm, changing, I'm, I'm tying on a fly. And he uh, he put it in there and slurp. Cool. I think we got an 18-inch fish. And it came out, and I was like, has it come out off the bank? And it's in a really heavily wooded section, like this timber all around. And I was like, 
that looks a bit bigger. And <laughs> I think you want to take be a little circumspect with this fish, you know. Yeah. And then it got closer, and I got my net extended out and got to see some scale. I said, Jim, I think that's 30. <laughs> And I was right. It measured spot on, and we got it in the net. And he got that on a five weight, five weight or six weight bamboo. Oh wow! And I, it, it was just it was enough rod. But every time that fish went for the bottom, it just bent that thing to the cork, and I'm it just sure. cushioned, the, cushioned the yeah, cushioned everything. It, but it may have saved them, right? I mean, yeah. had he yeah. had a spare rod or something, it was the right tool for the job. That's right. In his hands, it was the right tool. And so, you know, spectacular. That was really what you wanted to have. That was great. It wasn't, I don't know what it's going to be like next year. Yeah. Um, because we had those vagaries of the really high flows. And things. But I think, well, next time, what I'm going to do too is I'm, I'm going to spend more time on the, either the lakes or the smallmouth water. Yep. Right? Because they'll come and eat them as well. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I'm going to find where the best fishing is. And it might be on the white. It might be on Crooked Creek or the Buffalo. Um, it might be on the lake for carp. You know, yeah. You've seen the videos of my buddies in Tennessee and then Virginia. Yep. Um, some of Blaine's videos, catching them on dry flies. I don't care what it is. Let's, let's, let's go. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's bring it on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We do so similar here. Be kind of more... Sorry? We do similar here. I, I mean, I fish the Green River. It's very well known for cicada hatch. Yep. And um, one of the strategies that we use is, and some people might kill me for saying this, but we go fish the lakes in the morning. Put the drift boat in, yeah. tour around the bend. Get over by the rocks. There's more cicada in the water than you can imagine. All those fish come up to eat them: bass, carp, uh, trout, mm. etc. And we have a blast. And it's not as crowded yeah. as the river. Well, <laughs> the river is packed. So, yeah. So like last time, it, it, there were lots of places in the white you couldn't hear them. But right here at my house in Mountain Home, you couldn't hear yourself think. And on Norfolk, it was loud. So one of my things next year is spend some time on Norfolk Lake. Which also holds stripers. Mm. You reckon a striper would be one? Yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> that would definitely be fun. I don't know, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm keen to go look. And that's that morning thing. I think you, you're talking about that's going to be one of my game plans. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times we would do it and then go hit the river later, you know, if the day was yeah. right or whatever. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. And, you know, we're using motorized boats so we can move around. Yeah. And we can cover. We're, we on, cover we're on oars. It's miserable. <laughs> For a yeah. minute until you're Sorry, catching. <laughs> Let's do this though. Um, real quick, if somebody wants to book with you, how do they reach you at the shop and and book with you guys if they wanted to book for summer session or cicadas um, or something? Eight seven zero four three five six one six six. Um, you can go through that. Uh, you can put make inquiries through our website. It's the the Ozark Flyfisher dot com. Or you can hit me up, uh, hit me up via my Instagram too. Right now, there's a, I'm having a new website built because we're all independent contractors here. Yeah, um, and <laughs> yeah, it's a oddity. So I'm just building my website. But you can come in and holler at me, ask me any questions and whatever you, and uh, and get you hooked up. Okay. Uh, that my Instagram Steve underscore Dally underscore Flyfish. Okay. So, Cool. Cool. Yeah. We'll include this stuff in the show notes as well, guys. So if you guys want to get a hold of them, you know, reach out, et cetera. Yeah. Um, yeah. We got a really good team. We got a really good team of guys. We can put 11 guys on the water. And yeah. I mean, I've been there with groups. You've seen me, we've come with the, whatever, eight, 10 guys and you get us out yeah. and we switch slot boats every day with guys, have a great time, stay at a VRBO or one of the places you've recommended, et cetera. And it's just been fantastic. I mean, you've always taken really good care of us and we've, Cool. You get we into good fish, get into good fish. Yeah. We need to schedule another yep. trip. So maybe we'll do that. Maybe we'll, um, you know what? I'm going to try and put together a hosted trip. So anybody who's listening to the podcast yeah. wants to come out and do a hosted trip, uh, with me and, and get together with Steve and his crew. Uh, we'll schedule some time for that this year and we'll try and fill that up. So let's, yeah, let's, let's do that. It's good to see you guys again. Yeah. Um, Steve, you mentioned early on the importance of body position in your casting. And I love 
that when you talked about it with me, you said, do you ever notice a new beginner caster? They'll have a hard time not casting to the same space. And then you look at yeah. them and you realize right. they haven't changed their position at all. And that's why. So give us a little yeah. bit on what, what you see there, because you see a lot of people and, and how you've adjusted to that. Well, we've had a, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm generally I'm sitting, you know, three foot from someone watching them cast all day, every day. Okay. <clears throat> and you get a lot of time to think. But I remember this. I remember this when I was starting to cast and I, I could see it in people and, and brings back those reflections of why am I casting always in the same spot? Right? I'm standing here. I'm trying to, I'm trying to change direction and you can li you can, you can have some, a little bit of change in degrees, but really we forget about body alignment and how important it is like in golf. Your aim is set up by your hip position and your shoulders, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm terrible at golf, so I'm not going to give you any <laughs> tips at that. There's a reason I fly fish. But we tend to forget that shifting our feet and aligning ourselves to our target is how we make better casts, right? More accurate. And by, like, if I want to cast over that way, try and get some angle here on this screen, I need to turn to the left, right? Mm -hmm come back, I need to turn to the right. And as I started to say to you this morning, it encompasses everything you do. With... <laughs> Excuse me. It's the remnants yeah, of the remnants. COVID. Yeah. Excuse me right well, you're doing good now, at least. Yeah, oh, I'm upright. Um, but it, it, everything you do in terms of fishing, if your body is aligned in the right angle, everything's easier. And you've got to remember, straight cast at uh, Bill Gamble's five principles. Fly casting is best done in straight lines, right? So how do you change? Turn your feet. In terms of in terms of actually putting into practice, I really started building on this about two years ago. Some of my thoughts on this is getting people when you're nymphing, people will go generally nymphing out of a boat. It's either some guides like it straight across. I like it between 11 and 12, just being slightly downstream to help that first mend, right? Okay. But then with hopper fishing, I want you coming down. I want you fishing further downstream, further away from the boat, and being able to, if you stand 90 degrees to the current in your boat, right, or stand center line of the boat facing 90 degrees off it, mm -hmm. you're only going to cast there. So you need to turn yourself around and come downstream and fish at a much steeper angle. And you can't do that over by twisting your hips and changing your body. You need to be able to turn your feet and face in the right direction. The, the other parallel, and the stream of fishing is the same way. Depending on where you're trying to place your fly, you need to get yourself lined up so that I like to refer to it as Cedar Armstrong. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Right? I've got a point. Oh, there's, I've got a point at the camera. So that everything is aligned. If you can see my arm here, everything is aligned in a straight line. Bang, straight to your target. I went sideways, straight to your target. And that makes life easier. Right? You can actually put a more accurate cast in here because now your cast isn't going to twist. Right, depending on whichever way mm -hmm. that top loop will be sitting off to one side, right? That sucks when you're trying to put it into a gap. And one of the things about the hopper fishing here is, when that water's big, the the gap between the, the trees, trees is smaller, and right? The water is smaller, <laughs> right? Now you're having to put it into tight little holes, okay? And you're having to do it a lot, and that's what makes the difference. It makes it so much easier if your body is set up. And you're casting down that straight line. And you set yeah. it right, your body being set up, right? Because when you make yeah. that straight arm position, the ergonomics of your body and the strength of your power stroke is there. But when you start to come off of those at angles, it changes the ergonomics. So now you're using the weak side of your wrist or the, the weak side of your shoulder, et cetera, et cetera. And you start to yep. lose in those scenarios. Yep. 
you want to set me off on a little rant, start me talking about casting over this shoulder, right? That's right. And so you, you're casting you, over your... How far, can you, how far can you reach back? I mean, I've got a couple of dodgy shoulders these days and my back's a little... Broke my back when I was 19. So, But I can't reach back that far. But I sure as shit can this way, right? I can stretch kind of long, powerful cuts, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Lefty cray school, long salt water. I don't want to be doing this if I can at all deal with it. Well, I liken it to, sorry, I'm going to interrupt, but I liken it to, you made that position of, oh, I'm casting over my other shoulder, right? So say if I'm casting, I'm going to cast over my left shoulder. That's my weak shoulder. Well, imagine if you were trying to throw a fastball. Yeah. If you tried to throw a fastball off of your other shoulder, what do you think the result would be? And that's the same thing that happens to your cast. All the velocity and powder just falls off. And your accuracy mm -hmm. falls off. It's a, all those things that are so important to a cast, they fall off. But mm -hmm. when you keep that, maintain that, that body position, the feet position, et cetera, and bring your hand and arm over the right shoulder, you're right on target. Good things happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, I have a different background on this. On that. Yeah. But, I mean, the other thing you have in reverse when you're talking about, if you're talking about the hook setting, like I hate that hook setting. Right? And you mentioned before downstream hook sets coming off small stream fishing, which is fine. You can get away with it when you don't need to move the rod that far. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if I'm coming, if I'm coming this way and I've got a big long drop, like our river's eight foot high and I've got a lot of line to move and I've got a heavy weight to move, I don't want to come here, mm -hmm. right? Because where am I going? And then what am I going to do if that fish starts running towards me? Because if we're fishing in tight to the bank, fish runs out, how am I? This, right? Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. rotate, your, rotate your hips around, set over your right shoulder, set straight up. Straight up is the most efficient way to move that fly vertically in the water column, right? And it's not doing two things. Like, using, again, we'll go back before. If the current's going this way, right, and you set to the right, you set that way, right, you're pulling it out of the fish's mouth, mm -hmm. right? Yep. We all understand that. And you said to me, well, if you're going downstream, I'm going to pull it in their mouth. Well, what happens if that fish is eating? I've got a 27-inch brown trout out here that a kid caught second day's fly fishing, just spectacular fishing. With it. <laughs> it was just one of those guys that's gifted. But I stood up, and that fish ate, and we're fishing a girdle bug under a hopper. And if I hadn't seen it, we were nothing moved. But he had to set it straight up because that fish ate the Oh. Ate the fly and the current was going. He was at the following, same pace. yeah, yeah. Nothing moved. Yeah, yeah, and we get that. We get that up quite a bit. Yeah, and it that if you set downstream, you're going to pull it out of his mouth. That's right. Bang! There's a really there's a trophy fish. Gone. It's funny you say so that because like you up. know who was a stickler with setting straight up for me who? in my career who really kind of got me on that was Mark Paulson, who was one of your guides for a while. And mm -hmm. he was, he was a stickler on me. I remember my first time out there and he's like, no, you're missing fish, man. You're setting downstream. You got to set straight up. And I was like yeah. blown away. And it did, it changed for me that yeah. day. And, and not, I'm not going to say that my little square world is, yeah. is the only thing, but it works out here. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, I, it makes a big difference. Like on Norfolk, we're talking about differently. The guys in the back of my boat always want to sweep sideways, like a sweep upstream and low rod tip. It's kind of like a bass hook set. Mm -hmm. And they just lose fish after fish because it's just, phew, phew. it's hard. You know, fly fishing's hard enough. We just got to make it simple. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Don't get all that difficult stuff, yeah. right? Make it coming over here. Uh, yeah. yeah, stick to the basics. Down to the basics. Right? Just, be, just nice, simple box. Yeah why i don't drink beer when i'm fly fishing <laughs> <laughs> well steve it's been great like having you on yeah. man and uh telling us a little bit about the area especially the summertime i know i've been out there multiple times in the i would call hey, it all looks different. i would call fall you call winter um but i always come there in february for example and it's 10 feet of snow here and there's you know sometimes sun where you're at sometimes yeah. it's rain and i know it's cold um but uh yeah. You know, it's been spectacular well, fishing. A of times. Yeah, we've we've come some really good times, and uh, you've always talked about you guys got to come back in the summer. You guys got to come back in the summer, and 
Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So I'm going to set up some, some trip for sure. You and I can yeah. gather after this, get some dates picked and whatnot. And uh, I'd love to see some people from the show join us. It'd be awesome. Get as many people as we yeah. can there and hey, have a good time. Let me tell you, Christian. Let me tell you, Christian. It's way nicer when you can float these rivers and you're not in, you know, Gore-Tex and puffies <laughs> and <laughs> gloves and everything. And you can do it in shorts and a shirt, you know, shorts and a, a sun hoodie and, and sort of flip-flops. And it's just, yeah. for an Aussie man, it's like being at home. Yeah, I, I can certainly recall being completely bundled with hand warmers in and going, is mm -hmm. this really worth it? <laughs> it was so cold <laughs> one year. I mean, just being downpoured on, rain was freezing to your coats and boots. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to a summer right session. Yeah. Yeah. Looking forward to a summer Thanks, session. Thanks, buddy. It was Appreciate great seeing you, you bud. We'll see you guys next week. Too, Thanks for joining in. If you want to get a hold of Steve uh, yourself, again, it is uh, Dally Ozark Fly Fishy, Fly Fisher. Dally. Yeah. And uh, you can check that out. We'll have some notes in the, uh, or some addresses in the notes. And we'll go from there. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Mike.